Hi. Hi. Yeah, we're live now, so tell anyone uh, yelling in the background. All right. So we popped champagne and it wasn't so, so guys, typically oh. typically these sessions have moderators, but we do not have a moderator this time. Who wants to be a moderator? All right, All right. I'll, I'll, I'll get it going. Uh, yeah, so welcome to the 7 p.m. panel. We are five minutes over. Um, anyway, happy to you know have everyone here. We're going to be talking about uh, trading and cryptocurrencies. Um, so yeah, so right, right before we went live, uh, Mark, I was just talking with with you about uh, you know what you see about what's going on in, in the space now. No, well, I'm very lucky because uh, my uh, my Doge uh, position has really doubled. The bad news is that my TikTok account has been agreed. So I'm doing well on one hand and I'm not doing well on the other. Yeah, no, I, I saw that, you know, TikTok had a very fast rise and maybe it seems like a very fast uh, fall too. If it, gets, uh, if it gets blocked off of everything. I never put it on my phone because people were telling me that it could be spyware. Yeah, I don't have it on my phone. Either. Yeah, um, but yeah, um, I mean, Doge or Doggy Coin, if you like. Um, I, I, li I like saying doggy coin. Um, people will get into quite a disagreement about it. Uh, but the interesting thing is that's always, you know, bounced around in the same kind of Satoshi range, basically, if you look at its price versus Bitcoin over incredibly many years. And uh, uh, typically, you know, when it gets down into the 20, you know, something Satoshi range, um, it's always good for a, a little bit of a bump. Uh, well, I tell you, I, I know people who have used Dogecoin with their kids. They give their kids an account and they've told me, Mark, I can I can motivate my kid to clean their room for like, you know, three cents worth of Dogecoin. <laughs> and it also teaches them how to use a wallet. So uh, that's that's its primary use case, I think. Do you know if there are any kid friendly wallets? Because I, I was wondering about that. A lot of the wallets, you know, just shows you a lot of decimal places and it, it doesn't really give you any exciting, you know, animations or satisfying ka ching sounds, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'd be nice to even just have a you know friendly visualization of how much money you have as like a stack of coins or something that gets bigger. Yeah, that would be nice. We should do it. That's All not right. a bad idea. Yeah, because I mean certainly good for kids, but I think you know that appeals to anybody really. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, see, the doggy coin has been added to Robinhood, and you know that's a whole whole bunch of trouble right there. Oh my, I, I didn't that's, know that. That's that's what the the driver recently is. As I said, it said period, periodically had little pumps here and there, and you know the the founder of doggy coin, you know, specifically didn't want it to actually accrue value over time. Yeah. Uh, but you know, hey, you can want whatever you want. You know, <laughs> it's cheap enough to to buy this stuff up. You know, the market cap's small and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you add it to Robin Hood, then a lot of people start thinking it's some kind of hot stock or something, in addition to a, a meme. Um, well, the dog I, is cute. The dog is cute. It really is. The Shiba Inu mascot is great. That that really helps. Um, you know, I remember reading an article about you know wines uh, sold better if they had a picture of an animal on them than if they didn't. Well, let me tell you something. In in, in that industry, um, uh, what you want is something very expensive. Like Grey Goose, the the, um, the developers of Grey Goose, uh, it's a big joke because all they were doing is all they wanted was the most expensive vodka in its shelf space. And that's what they did. And it became widely popular. Yeah, didn't they sell for over $1 billion, the brand? Well, let me tell you, they were laughing all the way because if you look at uh, 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 interviews of the founder a long time ago, he was very upfront. He said, we just wanted the uh, most expensive by far. Uh, and vodka, remember this, uh, if it's not flavored vodka, vodka is a colorless, odorless, tasteless uh, uh, a mixer. So its property is tasteless, and yet <laughs> you have premium saying, we taste better. It's very yeah. funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a, a branding thing, not, you know, when people are actually do have, you know, Grey Goose versus, say, smeared off in a taste test, they, yeah. they do not prefer Grey Goose. And maybe that's a great metaphor for cryptocurrencies right now, right? People are people are buying it on Robinhood. They're not actually interacting with any of the real properties yeah. of the cryptocurrency. They're not tasting it. They're not saying, oh, is this actually secure against 51% attacks? Did the wallets work properly? Uh, you know, is there a development team on this that actually knows what they're doing and cares about it? Uh, they're just looking at just anyway. price, and that's the only source of information right there. Um, okay, so uh, so Peter, um, you're uh, you're in New York. We are. Look at this zap. See the zap. So we are in the New York City Watching Center. Cool. That just opened. They just opened apparently. 
and this space is amazing. So far, it's still going through some construction, and everybody's trying to do the social distancing, but the amount of champagne is way more than six feet away from each other. So uh, that's all I can say. Oh, no, that's great to see that. I mean, I remember the uh, the old, uh, you know, New York uh, Bitcoin Center was fantastic, and it's so important to have a physical space. For a lot of people, they need that, you know, just so that they know it's real. But also, it's just a place for people who are not very tech savvy to go to, and they know they can they can talk to people, you know, and learn directly, right? They can, uh, you know, have other people show them how to do stuff on their phone and that kind of thing. I mean, all I can say. I got it. After Anna stops like stops, stops disrupting me, <clears throat> so all I can say is, guys, you need to. Meet. Somebody needs to mute. So guys, all I can say is that 2013 was a revolution in terms of the Bitcoin Center that was right next to the uh, next to the New York Stock Exchange. Correct. So yeah. It was just revolutionary. And the fact that it's happening again and the type of people, the quality of people that are attending this location is very high quality, extremely high quality. So this guy's working and, and, and Mark is also in the center as well, just different location. We're trying to make this whole six distance stuff, but the quality is amazing. So I really hope that that's just an indication of, uh, an, of an uprising in the entire industry because the type of project, the quality of projects is far beyond just remittance, just payments. Absolutely. Um, uh, John, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to say where you're coming in from or, or not. Could be undisclosed location. Um, what, what are you thinking about uh, these days? It doesn't work in the market. Yeah, so um, I'm in uh, Connecticut, so uh, just right on the edge uh, of New York City. Um, but in general, um, I'm basically watching a few things in the market. Obviously, the Dogecoin pumps are exciting. Uh, the fact that some random celebrity decided they're going to pump it 340x is pretty cool, in my opinion. Uh, best of luck. I hold a bag. Um, so, realistically, it's it's exciting. I mean, it's like it's a game of you know finding capital and and finding liquidity. And Dogecoin pumps are historically just a great way of generating liquidity and then just dispersing it into another thing. And, seeing how high you can just pump it basically so i'm excited yeah and each one is worth less than a penny so if you're a serious trader then you might want to look at the mega dogies as your unit <laughs> yeah that's, that's what you know point. the big shots are, are looking at obviously one that's day, a million one day. it's a million of them yeah yeah it's definitely doable um yeah i just put on my twitter account recently a picture of me in front of the the hotel where they had the bread and woods conference i was wearing my satoshi millionaire t-shirt cool and, uh, you know, she's joking around with people. They're like, you're a Satoshi Millionaire? I'm like, yeah, that means I have, you know, $92 in, in Bitcoin. But that's that's what it is now. It's actually fairly fairly accessible for people to get into the Satoshi Millionaire level. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny to see the actual actual hotel, you know, a little piece of the, you know, monetary history. And it's just all these elites from all over the world gathering and saying, like, okay, this is how much this currency will be worth. This is how much this one will be worth. This this one will be worth. This is who's going to trade with who and what. And they're they're just con you know they're deciding everything for everyone else. Uh, but the, actually, that was one of the better you know modern day monetary policies. Uh, you know, which lasted up until 1971 and actually had fewer bank failures. You know, fewer hyperinflations, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no. Now I need to go to Jekyll Island. Uh, you know, and of course, uh, you know, the island of Yap for the rye stones as well. I actually met, a, a you know, a, someone at a Bitcoin conference who had been to the island of Yap. It's not that easy to get to. Wow. Where, Where they used it? to trade these, you know, large metal, these large stone disks as money, which are, you know, incredibly cumbersome. So mm -hmm. they decided after a while not to even move them and just say, OK, no, I'm reassigning the ownership of it to you. It's just it's going to stay where it is because it's incredibly heavy. It's in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like the tulip bulbs. Uh, people um, uh, conferred ownership, but they didn't do anything with them. They were just kept in these boxes till they rotted away, and uh, you know, uh, again, sold them and transferred ownership. Yeah, the whole the whole story was kind of you know about the tulips was kind of misconstrued, uh, it's just because uh, you know they were trading derivatives on tulips. They were you know they were specific you know actually fairly rare <laughs> varieties that you know you didn't have. Uh, you know, an unlimited number of, you could make more, but uh, you know, it takes actually some time to increase the stocks for that. 
and uh, it was a fairly short-lived phenomenon. It was yeah, virtually kind of right. Yeah, it was kind of exaggerated when they told the story about it. So it always struck me as weird when people hear about Bitcoin. They're like, "Oh yeah, that reminds me of 17th century Dutch flowers." <laughs> like that's what it makes you think of, you know. I mean, because look, other things have had prices that go up and down, you know, whether it, you know real estate or commodities, uh, you know, stock markets, currencies, all, all sorts of stuff has, has that, you know. So. I like to say the fact that Bitcoin has a price that goes up and down is its least unique property. That you know, that anything oh, yeah. that buy and sell does that. And anything that can go up, then people, you know, get excited about it and they buy it because it's going up. Right. And that's one of the things we're seeing with doggy coin right now. You know, I, I think that is a definitely a factor with the Tesla stock uh, as well. People are buying it because it's going up. They're buying it makes it go up further. Um, and you know, well-meaning people might try to short it, and they they, they end up being forced to buy higher because sooner or later they can run out of money. There's no upper limit. Absolutely, you know, zero is always the bottom, well, except for oil. Listen, but, as they say, the the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So you yeah. might be right and you lose all your money. Guys, oh, hey, Max, let me interrupt for a sec. Uh, so what's gonna what's going on with this whole sell-offs, right? So Bitcoin, I mean, S&P 500 drops, Bitcoin mm. drops. As if it goes up, Bitcoin goes up. Is it really a trend of asset? Yeah, I'm bombing about that. I was hoping. Talk to that, us. Uh, Mark, talk to us. They're definitely correlated, but the correlation yeah. is is fairly low. Uh, I mean, even things that are you know totally unrelated do have some correlation to each other. Like if you pick like a relatively good performing stock in the S and P 500 and a relatively poor performing stock in the S and P 500, they're still going to be correlated to each other over time because there's a lot of people buying and selling the S and P 500 as a whole, right? Or ETFs based on it. Well, when things go crazy, like for example, when you have a market drop, you have gold dropping. So uh, is gold a hedge? Well, it isn't. It's correlated in the beginning, but then you have some kind of disconnect. And I am hoping that at some point we have a disconnect with uh, Bitcoin, as people uh, uh, look to it as as really a uh, uh, gold 2.0. Um, and gold, I tell you this, when people start in with this, uh, 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 gold is, is always a good investment. What they forget is that in 1980, gentlemen, gold hit $850. It did not pass $850 for the final time until about 2009. So for 29 years, people uh, in the gold market were in the desert. And I have to remind people of this when they bring up this whole, oh, gold is so much better than Bitcoin business. And, uh, and, and they, look to, uh, they look up a long-term chart and uh, then, they, then they see. Yeah, you know? and if someone had bought 30-year treasuries and, you know, at the peak of gold, they would have been earning, what, 15% a year for 30 years? It's so, yeah, yeah. I mean, interest rates have been, uh, yeah. been basically in the down market for almost 40 years. Huh? So uh, any kind of fixed Market's income exposure would have made money. I'm, the way I yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Hey, Nick Spano said yeah, we should uh, take a crypto train ride to Jekyll Island. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> John, what do you think about this whole thing? The correlation? What's going on? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> it's one of it's one of two things, in my opinion. Either it's like on purpose or it's not. Um, so if it's on purpose, you know, I think it's sort of a setup for some very large uh you know decorrelation or decoupling or whatever and then everyone jumps on that to sort of convince people that it's real um if it's you know not on purpose i think it's just a risk off situation i think realistically you know bitcoin is still unproven um for most investors and people are able to manipulate the price technical analysis is one of the topics of today if you look at the chart we're right right on a you know downward trend we're right at the top of it so people are sort of looking for an excuse to short um and unless it's you know something that's manipulated not a lot of people or not a lot of volume i would say is going long so i i think it's either it's on purpose or it's not um and uh, you go from there basically so let's go let's, let's talk about this then what about portfolio allocation right so given the fact that everything is correlated how john start with you how would you guys like to position your portfolio given the fact that bitcoin is so correlated to the other assets in times of volatility events right john yeah i mean so the way that i think about it is you have your like all portfolio which is valued in us dollar or whatever respective currency you choose and then a uh, percentage of that is in bitcoin and then um percentage of that is for ultra high risk you know 
that's where the lack of correlation comes in. So those ultra <clears throat> high risk altcoins, low caps, I mean, I personally look for like 10 to 40 million. Um, and you know, if they're privacy and listed on Coinbase, that's just an added bonus. Um, but realistically, the you know the lack of correlation that you want is in that upside risk. We're making jokes about the lowest price that can go is zero. So I mean, if the lowest price of an altcoin goes to zero and you have a proper allocation, that's not a big deal. But if it goes up a thousand times, like that's a big deal. So, so let's yeah. assume you have an average investor, thousand dollars, right? Whatever, ten thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. It's not just cryptos, right? How how much would you allocate in this whole crypto universe? relative to the traditional? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I personally think it's like, if you take the classic sort of stocks and bonds split for risk tolerance, you could probably do a similar thing like that, just replacing, you know, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in the part of risk um, versus sort of, you know, safer investments. And then your safer investments, either, you know, pick stocks, put it in an index or just keep it in cash. But you What's want it to be stable. Still is the golden ratio. How much? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's no. I mean, like realistically. Like, come on! No, now listeners don't need that. They need the specifics. Well, the golden ratio is probably whatever you put the most work into, and you get the best rewards. And that's like, if you don't put the work in, you're not going to know if your rewards are worth anything. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have steady income and all your costs are covered, hundred percent. Like. I personally enjoy like very high levels of risk as soon as my basic needs are met. Um, I've lived my life like that for the past five years and you know, it's gotten me here. I'm pretty excited about it. So, you know, risk what you can and go hard on it. John, you, you young. So, uh, Mark, Mark is one of the legends. I've seen the, uh, the Yo. videos here the other day about the 2013 Bitcoin center. Mark <laughs> was freaking making markets left and right. The freaking legend. Right. Yeah, there. Was, Thank you so much. It was <laughs> it, it was fun. It was fun. In fact, in fact, when people look at the clips uh, of uh, Alan uh, uh, Stevo uh, doing his, um, uh, uh, you know, market making routine, uh, people kind of laugh. And I have to tell them, listen, in 2013, you could do it. I mean, earlier than that, people would go to a Union Square and it was called a Satoshi Square. And uh, Nick uh, had the great idea of bringing it uh, indoors. So I have to tell people you could actually do it at the at the time. Uh, as far as what, diversification, what's the golden ratio? Yeah. Well, well, as far as diversification is concerned, you know, you have when you have a, um, it depends how much people have. Uh, high net worth individuals will uh, diversify with um, uh, managed futures because managed futures, uh, unlike Bitcoin right now, uh, is more un, an uncorrelated asset to uh, stocks and bonds. They will also have alternative stuff like uh, real estate. Um, uh, uh, expensive paintings, collectibles, uh, precious metals uh, 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 held in different ways. So, you know, it, it depends. But I'll tell you this, as we know from 2017, that uh, you can have your basics like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then you can go into the alt forest and, and, and get, uh, you know, your compound and, and uh, curve and all the rest. But if we have a downdraft, it all is correlated. And uh, uh, I mean, the last go round, uh, uh, people laugh. They, they tell me uh, when they mention Cardano, I said, yeah, I got Cardano. And they go, hey, Mark, you're really lucky you got Cardano. I said, yeah, I'm lucky. I bought it in 2017 for 98 cents. You know, I've got uh, uh, Omizigo and uh, uh, I got uh, uh, Lumens and, and that type of stuff. But when the crash happens, things are highly correlated. Um, so let's assume you have, you have hundred thousand dollars to allocate, right? cash, whatever, what are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, when you talk to people like uh, like Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, they are very much not into uh, super diversification. In fact, uh, Munger, uh, uh, who is, again, uh, uh, the partner of Warren Buffett, will say that an individual could probably only have a very handful of stock because it's really a concentration of investments that you know about, that you can really watch have a risk strategy that's going to give you a, a, a really good return. Uh, unfortunately, the investment industry simply wants to uh, uh, give you a managed index product, uh, take their 1% and then get on to the next person. And I think it's a, it's a big abdication of the responsibility of, uh, of the investment industry. But if someone has a thousand, um, uh, you know, I would say, listen, you have to own uh, a Bitcoin. Uh, uh, Ethereum, as it, it's making its moves now, you probably want some of that. And then whatever, uh, you know, go into the alt, 
alt forest and find some things that find you uh, that are interesting to you uh maybe you you like the idea of uh swiss board because they're gonna go out and they're gonna execute on different platforms uh maybe you think uh, uh chain link is still undervalued uh, chain link uh, uh okay i gotta stop you right there on the chain link <laughs> <laughs> i go to my twitter chain link is there this guy's doing something something funky daniel so hundred thousand dollars what's up like um, don't the the other two gents they want to do 100 percent into crypto like that's freaking risky yeah so I, I tell people that would be crazy to go 100 percent into crypto but then i also tell people i'm 100 percent into crypto so you, you have to understand, you know, I'm telling them, don't do that. Just like, you know, I've told my dad, you know, oh, you don't want an Android phone, get an iPhone, you know, and then people cigarettes. ask me, well, which do you like better? I'm like, I would never use an iPhone. So, you know, it's because I don't want the tech calls, you know, about, you know, which email browser should I use? What, you know, this kind of stuff. It just makes it a lot simpler for a lot of people. So for a lot of people, um, you know, particularly if they're not tech savvy or just not savvy in general, right? I know people who, you know, they get a phone call from a stranger and they say, oh, there's a problem with your computer. You know, we're from Microsoft. We're here to fix your computer. So could you please log on to this website and download the software and run it? Um, and those people probably can't have any, uh, you know, actual Bitcoin at this point. I was thinking um, like the other day, it took yeah. me like three days to sync up a year, like nonstop, like one year of the ledger like since March 2019. So, I mean, an average person wouldn't be able to do this. So they'll go to some Coinbase or Gemini, whatever, use those wallets. It's, 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 it's mad. And that's Bitcoin. It's like a pretty like, you know, good solid product, good, good UX. Still like 100% into crypto for those people? Um, yeah, for some people, they might, they, I mean, they have to consider, you know, their own age, their own risk tolerance, um, you know, what their source of income is, whether it's, you know, correlated to crypto in any way or not. Um, and again, like, yeah, their level of wealth overall and how actively they're going to be trading things, right? If they just want something where they can just forget about it for 10 years, then I would suggest that they should be all in Bitcoin or all in, uh, you know, maybe some kind of uh, stable coin or digital security um, in addition to whatever, you know, stock bond and real estate uh, portfolio that is appropriate for them. Uh, but if someone wants to, you know, look at what, you know, might give them, you know, larger returns in the short term as long as they're willing to pay attention to it and, and get out if the project goes south or becomes extremely undervalued uh i think there's there's a lot of other interesting things to look at now certainly i would, I would be, tell people definitely look at ethereum look at monero um as as serious projects um and then in terms of things that people are super excited about now yeah Chainlink. i mean i'm just hearing about it from everyone all the time so and the project is not the project is not the project itself yeah i mean that's the thing the project so the project itself is not, as far as I can tell, it's not a fraudulent project, right? I read the white paper. Um, it's a very different experience than reading, say, something like Tron uh, white paper. Um, but at the same time, there's not really anyone that I can see that has made a case that if people actually use the product as intended, it would support a high valuation for it, right? So if people are using the Chainlink oracles, does that support, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar valuation of all these uh, tokens and what prevents people from again trying to reboot the project you know that that's happened with many things like even litecoin was essentially a reboot of another project tenebricks people felt the distribution wasn't fair uh with Chainlink, the distribution is extremely skewed um there's you know massive massive portion i believe a majority of Chainlink tokens are allocated to founding teams and developers on the project yeah. uh so Again, like if those people try to sell um, some or all of their holdings, it's going to crush this thing all the way back to zero. So question then, since this discussion is really going towards the fact that all of you guys, except for me, it seems like are, correct me if I'm wrong, are close to 100% allocated into crypto <laughs> and some money in the, in the like actual wallet in cash just to buy Pepsi uh, in the store. What features are you guys looking for? Like what, what qualities in a project? needs to be taken into consideration. And we're not talking about bullshit ICO 2017, freaking brown paper and, and great development team that is fake. What are the actual fundamentals that you would then look at before potentially allocating some portion of your capital to that project? Yeah, I was disappointed you said uh, no ICO stuff because personally I always look for Ryan Gosling on any development team. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, you got to look at sort of what's hot. You got to look at what people care about. Um, right now we're seeing like tectonic shifts in privacy 
So for me, um, Daniel mentioned Monero. Um, that's something, you know, has a unique code base, is privacy oriented and, you know, has stuff happening in the developer space. So, but the bigger thing I think is, um, you know, the ability to be adopted by the masses. We're talking about wallets for children. I think that's actually a brilliant idea, but you also need to solve the other problem, which you just discussed, which is wallets for old people. And I think there's actually a lot of overlap there. Um, you have big buttons, you have bright lights, you have yep. sounds like realistically, there's actually a lot of overlap in that. And you, you need access. I mean, right, we're talking about syncing um, like blockchains. That takes time, that takes resources and energy and knowledge. But it, anyone can just, you know, punch a bunch of keys in on their keyboard and go to Coinbase. So there has to be a wide, um, a wide on-ramp for the project so people are able to at least express interest in buying it. Otherwise, it, it just sort of you know falls away. So if I'm looking to invest in something for a shorter term, because I think there's going to be a large pump, it's got to have some thematic things that align with larger issues so that the narrative will reach a lot of people. And then the people have to be able to actually purchase the asset. That's the main thing that I consider. So John, mostly looking into momentum pretty much. Momentum buying fundamentals is not important, kind of. Kind of, so, so just follow the money. Yeah, so I mean, somebody somebody commented on Twitter um, basically saying, you know, it doesn't matter what you think. If they decide Dogecoin is the currency of the future, that's the currency of the future. Like, you don't have any say over it. So, like, that actually made me think, like, yes, there has to be con general consensus around something. I mean, that's why we all value Bitcoin other than, like, the technical stuff is everyone else values Bitcoin and we all agree that it has value because we're constantly transacting in 24-7, you know, markets. So... I think at the end of the day, people make choices and then you have to figure out, you know, what's the most viable path to the largest valuation and just, you know, pay attention and talk to people. Mark. You know, I, 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 I've, I've got a question for you guys uh, because I've been thinking about Monero and I'm thinking though that uh, as we get better uh, mixers and um, we can get more privacy through uh, putting, let's say, our BTC through a mixer or something like that that the use case for something like uh, Monero will drop. I mean, I, I could be very wrong, but that's what I was thinking. And I really would like to know what you guys think. Well, Monero could be completely useless in say 10 years, but for, for at, least, at least the next few years, it's the only uh, cryptocurrency that's uh, private by default with strong enough privacy that you're not essentially just leaking everything. How many people, how many people are using the privacy though for Monero? Well, it's it's private by <laughs> default, so it forces one hundred percent to to basically do it. You know, so you can't just look if someone if someone says, mm -hmm. "Hey, send me Monero at this address," you can't look up how much is associated with that address. Yeah, it's not, uh, and you can't see, you know, real. who yeah who they also interacted with and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other privacy coins that are all either fairly weak privacy or highly experimental privacy or are extremely centralized um, or just they're projects that are severely flawed in other ways, or they're opt-in privacy, right? Zcash and Dash are both opt-in, which in practice okay. is completely useless, right? If the default is no privacy, 99% of people pick the default. And that's exactly what we see where, you know, on Zcash, 99% of transactions don't use the privacy features of it. And in fact, Coinbase doesn't even allow you to use the privacy features when depositing or withdrawing. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's good because I thought Zcash was a uh, a strong competitor to Monero, but now Daniel, that that you pointed that out, I could I could see that it's a, a, a you know a distant uh, a competitor. Yeah, and one of the other problems is that they had the trusted uh, you know initialization, the trusted setup basically, um, where you have to trust that all the people who set it up did not keep certain pieces of information, which would allow them to make as much Zcash in the future as they wanted to. And they did take some steps to try to get a wide variety of different people who all have reputations. But at the same time, there's no way to actually prove that people deleted information that they had. You can prove that you have information, but you can't prove that you don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so that's yeah, kind yeah. of a you know problem hanging over it. Also, <laughs> the, the launch of it was uh, was pretty ugly, and, it, and it's just a much more centralized development team. The other thing, I think in, if you're looking at, I mean, I always go back to momentum and network effects just because that's the stuff that I've, I've observed the largest reactions from. And realistically, I mean, it's the same as why people think Libra is bullish for Bitcoin. It's going to A, make people more aware of what cryptocurrencies are. 
even if it's not a cryptocurrency. Right. And B, it's going to be proven to be inferior to the king. So Monero is the king of privacy just because it has the longest track record, the most, you know, I mean, it's a unique code base from Bitcoin to the best of my knowledge. So at the end of the day, how, however many privacy coins come up, they're always going to be compared against Monero. And as long as Monero is still better, um, you know, I think it's just going to add fuel to the fire for Monero. But then privacy versus liquidity, right? They have Monero. Good luck finding buyers and sellers, right? Like, relative to Bitcoin. Which is well, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's a less liquid of a market, definitely. It's a lot less liquid. A lot less liquid. When it, specifically OTCs, right? When this whole, when this whole, I mean, not necessarily the case for the U.S. But other countries, Venezuela, Russia, China. I mean, no, from the first experience of talking to people who live there, it's like the, those OTC markets are so developed. So this whole uh, liquidity is really number one uh, factor, while the uh, you know this whole privacy thing is the number two because the privacy is being solved by the liquidity on the OTC markets. That's how it was here in New York City, right? Mark, I mean, that's <laughs> in 2013. Uh, you mean... Buying for cash, buying for cash, literally. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people would be in the Bitcoin center with literally thousands of dollars in their pocket. It was, yeah, the market has changed so yeah. much now, though, from, yeah. you know, where it is, uh, you know, now uh, all, you know, you have all these Bitcoin ATM operators that have gotten respective licenses and so on. Um, there's all sorts of new on-ramps and off-ramps. Wasn't so there something about uh, 7-Elevens you can now, uh, you know, buy Bitcoin as well? Really? Mm -hmm. um, you know, through another, you know, third party, but still. I'm still surprised that uh, Grayscale can uh, get the um, premiums that it can for its uh, Ethereum uh, trust. I mean, the premiums have been have been shrinking for the Bitcoin trust. Uh, they got a little bit of competition, but I will be very, very happy when we finally uh, get some kind of, um, uh, you know, coin uh, settled uh, uh, ETFs. And then and then I think uh, more high net worth individuals can enter it because right now, if you enter through, let's say, uh, Grayscale, you are going to pay um, a lot. Yeah, two percent uh, annual fees in addition to sometimes insane premiums. Well, you can you can go on to the Grayscale uh, site and they will tell you um, how much uh, BTC is in each unit. It will tell you how much um, you know ETH is in each unit. Uh, the ETH one, uh, there's something like a, a, a two hundred and fifty percent premium, and and I have seen it. I've calculated it, uh, and it, sometimes it's been a nine hundred percent premium. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you're, a, let's say, a wealth advisor and you've got someone who wants exposure to uh, crypto, um, you know, it's a very easy decision. You don't have to worry about advising them to get a wallet or, or open this or mistake. What you do is buy the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Grayscale uh, Trust. It, it, it trades openly. And if it's not a good deal, you know, uh, no one seems apparently to be concerned about it. Uh, again, at least their premium has has shrunk, but I'm still kind of surprised that it's uh, you know as popular as it is. The premium shows the the need and the demand for an ETF, yeah, yeah. which I, would I, which would never yeah, and the ETF would absolutely. you know track properly. You know, even in I, bullish I, scenarios, it shouldn't go more than one percent premium. Daniel, you are, I mean, I I can't I I I shake my head. I I don't get why we don't have one. Uh, you know, I know, the, I know why. You know, I, I, when I there's triple inverse volatility, they can't talk about volatility. Uh, you know, I mean, when there's so, triple inverse financial ETFs listen, and all sorts of dangerous products that uh, you know wipe out retail. Absolutely, the the the, 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 the triple ETFs uh, for ninety nine percent of the retail population are are a big problem. Most people don't understand them. I, I used to talk to the direction uh, of people earlier, and they would say nobody. I mean. Uh, these were the uh, outside um, uh, sales guys. So they would be talking to advisors who theoretically were smarter and and they would tell me no, nobody gets it. And this was when they would just double uh, positive and double uh, uh, inverse. Now there's triple. Um, you have no control. You have no control of supply for the ETFs. I think ETFs for, for Bitcoin is an easy solution just like stable coins. 
I think it's a stable bullshit solution. I don't think that's a real solution to the whole liquidity issue. I think people just need to man up and fucking learn about what is going on. <laughs> like seriously, because <laughs> buying an ETF, okay, now what? So now you bought an ETF, you bought a USO ETF, you got burnt. You, you it is something like one of the one of the big ETFs got you know got out right throughout this whole crisis, uh, throughout the self. Uh, the, the the stocks right now pumped and nobody understands why, and everybody's just happy about this. Right, he also changed the uh, changed the uh, the I mean, she forgot the, the term sheet completely, and still nobody knows what the hell is going on. Not just supply and demand, not even tied to anything, uh, practically. Right, so that's an easy solution. Again, just like stable coins, the reality is this crisis is a great opportunity for people to really understand what is going on with the central banking system, and try to educate themselves regarding stop switching the responsibility of their shoulders for their financial future. Sounds like high level words, but it really is what is necessary. Peter, like if people, not an issue. people are going to kick the can down the road. What, what happens is this is the cycle of life. They kick the can down the road. They get more financing. They kick the can down the road. And then all of a sudden, you will have a, uh, an event. And then at the time of the event, the people handling that will say, oh, my God, this is a terrible legacy issue. These people in, in back of us did something terrible. And going forward, we're going to do X. But, but kicking the can down the road is, is, is a tried and true um, you know, human being uh, endeavor. So, um, I mean, I agree with you, Peter, but I'm not betting on it. <laughs> I, think, I think the real the real answer is just to own some really mainstream media outlet. That's the real, for the, by, by, by the blockchain, by the Bitcoin, whatever, crypto community. Right? Because when things go bad, right. it's always the media that tries to manure and hey, here's an yet a new answer by this central bank or by this economy or this country, but it's never is a solution that works for 95% of the population. It's always a solution that works for, for the minority. That's for the elites who are actually managing that whole media outlet. So I think we just need to start investing more into the media outlet. We got one right here. We got one right here. We need to keep expanding the popularity. The next time this thing happens, Everybody must know the independent view of whatever. It's going to be biased for you, obviously, by us. But the thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you know, it, it's still fairly expensive to buy a newspaper, although it's getting cheaper all the time. Uh, there's a saying, you know, never go to go to war with somebody who, who buys ink by the barrel. Um, but, yeah, definitely it's, it's good to uh, have the, you know, mainstream media, uh, you know, write something positive or factual about uh, cryptocurrencies is I hate to see people get in because, you know, they, they saw something in the New York Times in, you know, December 2017 saying everyone's getting rich off of Bitcoin. And then six months later, you know, running an article like, oh, my God, all these people lost all their money buying Bitcoin at the top. Yes. Well, um, you know, people who are following crypto closely, you know, they, they know, you know, you can buy in bear markets and that kind of thing. And unfortunately, the mainstream media doesn't report until you get the fresh all time highs. Uh, even in 2017, most of the reporting didn't really start until Bitcoin was like well over 3,000. Um, it, it's just so unfortunate. When it started the year at 800, and there were certainly no uh, no articles about it then. What about uh, this year? What about this year, Daniel? Same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't expect down 30. To see, Bitcoin was up. Yeah, I don't even expect to see anything, you know, uh, while we're still under 20,000. I mean, certainly not, and that would, you know, excite regular people to start buying. Uh, and that's why, uh, yeah, I would like to see, you know, more people, um, try to reach out to mainstream news if they're willing to, and if they have the patience to do so, um, Anthony Pompliano went on the Bill Burt podcast recently. I think he did a great job, um, explaining to, you know, normal people basically, uh, you know, a little bit about how this works and why it's important, especially now with what's going on. Um, oh, I just want to add something else about the, the you know, Bitcoin S&P correlation, right? Over the long term, the correlation has been zero, but certainly it has been positive, um, you know, for the last, uh, well, for the year to date, basically. And um, what's interesting, though, is that Bitcoin is up about 30 percent year to date and the S&P 500 is down about 5 percent year to date. Yes. So, yeah, they're correlated, but those are not comparable returns, mm -hmm. right? If your portfolio is up 30 percent or down 5 percent, you would be like, yeah. These two portfolios are pretty much the same thing. But we're not talking about monthly correlations, right? Or, or we're talking about like intraday, like hourly correlation yeah. is probably going to be significant if it's a rolling period of say six hours, specifically during the time of high volatility. John, you're working with the MoonPay project. Yeah. Talk to yeah, us. Yeah, super exciting. <laughs> so uh, basically, um, I founded a Greenwich Bitcoin meetup about three years ago now um, with the goal of basically getting as many smart people together around me to sort of elevate 
my own uh, understanding because uh, as they say crypto is like everything you don't understand about economics uh, combined with everything you don't understand about computers so uh i figured you know i have to really aggressively pursue knowledge um luckily after about three years and like 30 different opportunities and 250 people um i was introduced to the team at moonpay who has basically been on a bit of a tear uh, in growth. And it's just super exciting. We're basically building a B2B2C as well as a retail operation for providing access to crypto assets um, all across the world. The goal is to get to 1 billion customers. Realistically, we're currently adding about 150,000 new customers a month. So that's growing, everything's growing. It's great, I'm super excited. I was the first operations hire basically, and um, it's uh, it's a lot of work, but there's a lot of return in it. So I'm very excited to- How are you guys different, how are you guys different from the traditional, uh, you know, other solutions, Paxful and, and pretty much Coinbase, you know, and all the others? Sure, well, we don't work with the federal government to provide surveillance data on our users. So that's a serious leg up on Coinbase. Um, as for the other ones, we are basically doing sort of a dual operation. As I said, the B2B2C to end the retail operation provides us with a very robust data set, um, which we are basically building our own fraud detection system on. So currently we have that uh, through a partner, but we have enough data now that we're able to deploy this soon. So we're looking to a very bright future with an ability to do better fraud detection than any other person that we're aware of basically in the space. Interesting. That's a DeFi project officially? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a data science project. <laughs> data science project. Yeah. The price all, all on the rise. I don't, oh, yeah. mention, I don't want to mention that one project that you guys all mentioned today enough like literally go i'm going on twitter 60 percent of crypto traffic is for that project yeah i don't think it's all real traffic fyi we're doing some analysis right now well there's no so, way to i mean yeah this, there's no way you know nomics like they're doing the best investigative um analyses on the data behind that and they have basically found that most of it like you said is smoke and mirrors so I'm always skeptical of new news stories. So Compound definitely uh, hit my radar of suspicion. But with Dogecoin, that's got like historical precedent. So yeah, I'm going to buy if there's a dumb new meme. That's so, historically a good plan. <laughs> guys, I, I asked you that question. Let me answer this question myself first. Like when it comes down to fundamentals, I believe, yeah, momentum is very interesting. Forward the money is very interesting. Yet very short term things, very short term strategies. They change all the time. S&P 500 drops 20% and all this momentum does not work anymore. Uh, from the fundamental perspective, the listeners, I mean, just <clears throat> our personal opinion on the situation, we're not trying to you know, say that we are the, the right ones on that, but we noticed very high correlation between the success of the project and the number of nodes, number of transactions and liquidity. And we're talking about real liquidity. We're talking about number of blockchain transactions for that specific project. And we're talking about the number of nodes which pretty much eliminates most tokens. We're talking about coins, not necessarily tokens, which again, really surprised me again when it comes down to this project that you guys all mentioned uh, today, because it doesn't have any notes. Uh, so what do you guys think about those fundamentals? Do you have any view on that? What have been your experience? Or this is just, again, just, just our crazy thoughts. I mean, I, I think it's sort of ironic that we're talking about fundamentals at all uh, in any market, to be totally frank. Um, it's just we're, you know, not to quote the, the copy paste thing about we're in a new paradigm where, where, you know, bubbles don't exist. But we are in a new paradigm where modern monetary theory is just being, you know, fully on steroids. So any fundamental analysis is inherently flawed, is my opinion at this point in time. Yeah, I heard some people saying that the fact that you have a lot of people staying at home and a lot more people unemployed is actually driving uh, the, some of the markets now, that you have a lot more people trying to trade to make money or simply because they have the time or because, yeah. you know, there's no sports on TV, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's definitely changed the way a lot of markets are behaving. There's also the expectation that, uh, you know, you have the Fed put, uh, you know, that um, if we start to cry, you can buy whatever the hell you want to buy. Yeah, let's SPY, you're going to buy a broad based ETF. 
and you know that um, if we're going to go down uh, 30 percent uh, that the Fed might buy. I mean, the Fed was started buying fixed income ETFs. They then started buying individual corporate bonds, which shocked me. I, 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 I've never uh, heard this. And now uh, I understand that it, it isn't their power to buy individual stocks of companies. That's craziness. You know, well, how, you're going to pick winners and losers. They're going to buy stock. I mean, th this is we're in insanity level. I came from Russia. It's crazy for me. Like, it sounds really crazy. I mean, they criticized the nationalization of all these companies 20, 30 years ago. Now they're doing the same thing. <laughs> Come on. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in Russia, at least it was strategic for natural resources. Here it's just like, yeah. It looks undervalued. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not even a good it's not even a good strategy because, again, if valuations are sustained at extremely unnaturally high levels, then, you know, regular investors don't want to buy there, really. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And then uh, you end up with, uh, if they want to keep sustaining it there, then you end up with, uh, you know, the government of the Fed just buying more and more of the market. And then you don't have a, a normal functioning market that says, okay, we need to allocate money from this company to this company in any kind of sensible way. The really funny thing for me was that uh, the Fed actually bought a junk bond ETF, several different ones, including one that their ticker symbol is JNK, junk. I didn't know that. Yeah, which again, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'll check the charter, wow. but I'm fairly sure that's it's not part of them being predictable. <laughs> that's not part of their chartered functions of, you know, protecting the the functioning of the dollar and interest rates is to, to start buying junk bonds for I, what? Why? What? I mean, the maybe, the, maybe the compensation change. Going, junk bonds the, are going down in price. The, the current market. The compensation they should be change. Maintaining their price. The bonds yes, maybe they're up getting two and twenty. They get into Peter. They get into two and twenty. No, one and ten. One in it's, it's, uh, hedge funds it's one times, back times, one in ten. <laughs> They're gonna switch back to two twenty when times are good again. Okay. My okay. goodness. Well, I tell you this. Uh, uh, I'm glad I'm in the company of other people who have a tremendous percentage in uh, uh, crypto. I thought I was the only sucker. I mean, I, I listened to Dan, Dan Held. Dan Held is very funny uh, because uh, he has said that he has um, seen his entire net worth go up and down by eighty percent. Four times. I mean, the guy must have a lot of Maalox and 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 nerves of steel. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I've got I've got like way too much of a percentage. But I'm glad to see I'm I'm with you guys. You know, just to clarify, Thank about six months ago, I was at zero percent. So, Whoa. like, yeah, when you start to see, I mean, first of all, you look you look at like if we're gonna do fundamental analysis, you look at post havening you know trends, and basically it comes out to like the next bull market comes within 20 months, usually around like, what was it? Was it two years and two and a half years? Basically there's, there's a period of time where, you know, historically it's a pretty small data set granted, but historically a certain amount of time passes and then interest starts and then somebody lights a spark that sets off, you know, the, the FinTech bomb that is crypto. So at the end of the day, I think, yeah, um, it is a short term thing. You guys are right. But for me, I mean, some people are planning 40, 50 years in advance. I mean, a friend of mine is a long, lonely fund where they literally their horizon is 40 or 50 years. Yeah. Um, but you have to think about this in terms of cycles. You have to think about this in terms of momentum, because realistically, you know, fundamentals are garbage, even in a normal regulated market at the moment. So people are just going to be gambling. I mean, people are definitely at home. People are definitely just looking for something to spend their money on because this is America and we get, you know, a great amount of dopamine from that. So it's, it's a short term thing, but it is something that I find one of the most promising short term things, three to five years. I don't think anything's going to beat crypto. Well, I tell you this, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, but I do not have a 40 year time horizon. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long term. No, I'm out. Very optimistic. Yeah. We should, I mean, th th this uh, panel turns into such a casino. We should put like disclaimer everywhere because people who will be watching this will start buying some, I don't know, some, some dodgy. Well, I, I, I got news for you. Uh, my bubble was burst um, uh, with the stock market. Uh, I, I mean, that is a big casino too. In fact, I was a very long time member of the um, Cotton Exchange, which is World Trade Two, which had crude oil and um, uh, metals and coffee, cocoa, sugar. And in that place, uh, uh, it was like a casino. You didn't know if it was night or day. You could, there, there were no windows um, and there was a lot of activity. 
um, it, it was like a casino floor. And no it was anywhere. It, it was a casino, and and it didn't matter whether you were doing a a, a, a gold, a silver, or crude oil, or or, or um, uh, cheddar cheese, or 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 coffee, or pork bellies. You know, um, you know, you guys are right. And, and fundamental analysis was thrown out the window. I mean, that was the purview of technical analysis. But you guys market. were mar mar making markets as well, so you guys made money in commission regardless, probably, right? Because you guys no, were no, no, no. That was that was. Uh, I mean, uh, Peter, th there was. The the uh, well, first of all, I, I was always a, a prop trader uh, and market maker, and there's no there's no commission there. My own specialty was as a volatility uh, derivatives trader, so I basically had a position I could trade against. Um, uh, you know, there was a big dichotomy of guys who did uh, futures and ex order execution, and uh, the prop trader option guys. The option guys were like you guys. I mean, you guys are 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 are, are real. I'm very impressed with all your bios as far as uh, uh, math is concerned and all the rest. Uh, I mean, I mean, all three of you probably uh, in your own heads could, could uh, uh, you know, calculate a Black-Scholes model for an option. Uh, me, I used to keep calculators in my trading jacket. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. It's funny how a trader, like a, a trading legend, an economist, and two fintech guys walking in a bar <laughs> to realize that 90% freaking leverage and Bitcoin and all the other stuff. And they invited to the panel and the question about, you know, allocation that is supposed to be answered with 60, 40 and 1% into crypto is like, that's all sh like, no, because yeah. especially six months ago, that was crazy. So load it up six months ago, all the cash, all the $1,200 bonus, all that stuff is boom. Well, and you know, Peter, you, mentioned, you mentioned the 1%. And, and we've been mentioning, you guys have been mentioning the catalysts. Uh, 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 and, and I have to say, well, first, I thought the big uh, downdraft in the S&P and Dow would have been a catalyst. Okay, it wasn't. But I do think it has been under, I mean, it was in the news, news but I think it's underrated. Uh, um, Daniel uh, uh, mentioned that, um, it, you know, BTC is higher than the, um, and the, and the markets. And that itself is a tremendous advertisement for crypto because all those high net worth individuals, all those people with uh, uh, foundation portfolios, they're all going back and they're asking their advisors, hey, listen, how come I don't have at least some exposure? Remember this, you could, you, you could have a very conservative university endowment and at this point, you're gonna have a managed commodity futures. It was many years ago that, that, that the fact that it was uncorrelated would be something a reasonable person could do. So they will have that. But they don't have a crypto exposure. And then when Paul Tudor Jones came in and said, "Listen, I'm not a, a Bitcoin bull, but I cannot uh, 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 ignore it now, and I want at least one percent of my funds um, to be in in BTC." And he's a very high um, profile uh, guy. He used, used to be a cotton trader, by the way. So uh, I've always liked the guy. So maybe that's a catalyst. You know, P people can't ignore it anymore. That's, is, that's he, is he five percent of the volume right now? I mean, of the holdings. I mean, he bought a tremendous amount. One percent or five percent? Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he came out publicly and he said yeah, just recently, that he yeah. wanted one or two percent of his funds to be in in crypto. And I thought, like, wow, this is great because all those organizations that had it on the back burner could no longer have it on the back burner. Because what are you going to do? You're going to tell your 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 fifteen million dollar client, oh, we're still looking at it, and, and I don't know, and and you know, you you can't do that anymore. Know? The other thing, the other thing that was interesting with the Paul Tudor Jones letter was um, it it basically, uh, like Mark said, it basically you know released the flood the potential floodgate, but it also gave uh, people what uh, a good friend of mine Rory Murray called air cover for investors, and this is what you're yes. talking about. Yes. Mark. This is reputational air cover. We know in finance that. You know, I like to say there are no creative thinkers in finance. Um, you basically see what is working and you do that a little better, a little different. You get better fees, whatever. But like you said earlier, Mark, most people are actually just building indices of the market. They're not actually stock picking anymore. Um, but this, I think, is a, a new conversation. I mean, Grayscale put out a research report. So granted, it's highly skewed in their favor. But they said that they they uh, queried, I think it was a couple thousand wealth advisors and the year over year change in queries from their customers about Bitcoin 
right I, you know i think it went up like three to five times and their actual requests for exposure to bitcoin went up like 40 or 50 percent so we might still be early i think um we need a few more people in the you know providing that sort of air cover uh to really say i own it paul tudor jones said i have owned it right. That's right. a little different. Also, he said it was his personal holdings that he would look to have as 1%, not the holdings of his funds, as far as I'm aware. I, I think, no, I, I think he said it across his, his, his funds. But John, you are absolutely correct. Because in the beginning, if you look back, uh, uh, you know, uh, 25 years ago, and you went to a university and said you should have an own correlated asset in, in uh, commodities, everyone would have, would have shown you the door. And then there must have been a couple that said yes, providing exactly what you said, air cover. And now you probably cannot look at a large endowment uh, of a not-for-profit or anybody who doesn't have some small exposure to managed commodity futures. Especially uh, after they got the, the, the loans. Especially after they got loans and probably invested them all into alternative assets. I mean, people don't want to look stupid. They want to look look smart, you know, and they think that they want to get rich, but a lot of times is they just want social approval, right? So right now, you know, if somebody, yeah, if somebody had said, oh, I put all my money, I put all my money into ether, you know, in, uh, in 20, you know, 2016 or whatever, people be like, wow, that's so, that's so amazing. You're so smart. You know, you made millions of dollars. And then imagine the alternate universe if the project just failed, right? It could have failed. It wasn't guaranteed to be a success. And then people would be like, wait a minute, you're telling me you put all your money into a project called Ether, which was invented by an 18 year old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why yeah. would you do that? Of You're course, basically describing, uh, what's his name? Um, Carlos Matos of BitConnect. That's about uh, as public as you can get of a brutal to zero path, yeah. Yeah, there's there's plenty of uh, charts of things that are uh, you know Bitcoin's price and you know chronologically reversed. You know they started very high and they just keep going down, down, down. You know, with some ex some volatility, some excitement in there, but basically it's a you know euthanasia roller coaster. I don't think a lot of these projects. You know, I think that uh, as long as it keeps going down, you know, you 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 need that fundamental value or you need that momentum, and if you don't have either. Uh, you know, it's toast. And if they have some worthwhile ideas, then they should adapt it into another project, uh, you know, new one or existing. Gents, so point. it's uh, it's almost an hour. Let's start wrapping up. Maybe the last question regarding, I mean, all, I mean, somehow, somehow, I was not sure how, but all of us are loaded up. So now what are the expectations? Three to five years from now, not trying to be optimistic, not trying to trade trends, momentum, any of that stuff. What is the real expectation? There's a reason why we are loaded up. Like there's a real reason, like our lives on the line, the lives of our loved ones, etc. Whoever is dependent on us. All the our money, dogs. Heard, <laughs> our dogs, yeah, especially. Uh, was the, the, the query the CX exchange can relate to that. Uh -huh. uh, if you guys heard about the story. So what are the expectations three to five years from now? in terms of the price, in terms of the market cap of the industry? So uh, realistically, you got three things. I mean, you have China's digital currency project, um, you have Facebook's Libra, and then you have um, basically the, I mean, geopolitical sort of macro just trauma that, you know, it's heading our way. This is just like another cycle. Realistically, Ray Dalio's written, what, four or five books on debt crises. And if you look at it in terms of a cycle or a super cycle, you know, the direction is down and the, the problems increase for everything there. I think uh, it's going to get a lot of air cover from better investors. I think it's going to get a lot more media coverage from both anti-China rhetoric and anti-Libra and pro-Libra. Um, and then ultimately someone is going to develop an app that lets you just press a button and purchase it. And so market gonna... cap, John, talk to us market cap, roughly 55 years from now, give us a range, give us something specific. Cause I mean, it's the panel, every single panel is like, we should watch you. Nobody knows what the hell's going on. Okay. I mean, I'll go back to the white paper. This is either going to be worth a lot or this is going to be worth nothing. I mean, it's literally you're a binary thing. You're 90%, you're 90% in. Over a specific timeline. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent almost, but it's not you know you have to you have to adapt you you can't just have one plan for 40 years you'll you, someone will see you with that and they'll take you out for sport like mark what is it uh, i was going to say that, that that i think if if crypto was going to die 
it would have died in in maybe the first crypto winter and i'm talking about the crypto winter in let's say uh, uh 2010 and then we went to a second crypto winter in from 2014 to 2015 and if it was going to die it was going to die then now i think we're lucky in that we have a lot of vested interests institutional interests who absolutely uh, uh, uh want this to survive so i i think we'll have our gyrations but i think if you're going to do a three five year time horizon way higher um so yeah i'd say there's not you know financial advices for entertainment purposes only but imagine how entertaining it will be <laughs> when bitcoin <laughs> goes to six figures <laughs> And you'll be like, see, I was the genius. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I expect Bitcoin to go into six figures, um, you know, and then, you know, I sooner rather than later. But again, you know, who knows? Right. But I really do think that will happen in the next three years. Um, and, uh, you know, again, like I, I'm not even trading the stock market or the bond market, uh, you know, or individual stocks right now, because I don't know if they're going to bail it out or not bail it out. Right. Nobody's giving me the, the tip off the phone call that they're about to do this. All I know is that they are going to keep doing bailouts in general and every bailout that they do, all right, they're not bailing out Bitcoin, but every bailout indirectly helps Bitcoin. Every time they're printing more money, more money, that's all going into the system. And ultimately that Bitcoin is the beneficiary of that. Perfect. All right. So let's wrap up. I mean, before I wrap up, first of all, thank you guys who is watching. Check out the Blockchain Center. It's growing. It's really growing. Uh, the space here out west side New York City is freaking amazing. Both of us, Mark and myself, are there. I'm not an affiliate. I'm not a promoter. But Zep Project, check it out. Zep.org uh, behind me. Moonpay, check it out by John. Uh, find us on LinkedIn. Everybody's available, right? Mark, Daniel, myself, John. Everybody's available. And last, assign, uh, last announcement, Blockchain Center upcoming seminar with UC Berkeley professor Gregory LeBlanc. Okay. June 21st. June 21st, which is what? Not June 21st. July 21st, guys. It's already July 9th. July 21st. Um, so it's going to be blockchainsensor.com slash education. Check it out. That's it. Thank you okay. so much. Thanks so much for watching. We're a little bit over time, but perfect. And thanks to the audience. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.